Additional funders have committed to match that $30 million. And who were these new partners? One of them was Jeremy Grantham, billionaire, world's leading timber investment advisor. They were not investing in trees to turn them into nature preserves. Which might answer another riddle. Why is this name redacted on the Sierra Club's tax return? Would they be embarrassed to take $3 million from a man who made his living selling the forests of the world? Bloomberg bringing a timber investment billionaire to the party was no coincidence. Bloomberg sponsored a UN climate session to discuss wrapping up biomass and biofuels around the world. Billionaires were in love with the idea of turning what was left of nature into green profits. Remember when Al Gore had gotten Richard Branson to invest billions into saving the planet? Richard Branson, founder of Virgin Atlantic, powered a Boeing 747 from London to Amsterdam on a coconut oil mixture to highlight the potential of this amazing oil as a clean energy biofuel. Branson had actually invested in biofuels he was attempting to replace the jet fuel damaging the planet with biofuels that required the consumption of the living planet. And it was game on for the airline industry. Dozens of researchers from all over the Northwest gathered in Missoula the past two days to explore the idea of converting the region's massive reserves of wood into jet fuel, especially with the demand for aircraft fuel expected to grow by a billion gallons in the Northwest alone. United Airlines will buy a $13 million stake in biofuel company Fulcrum Bioenergy. The airline used 3.9 billion gallons of fuel last year. What technology was Silicon Valley billionaire Vinod Khosla hoping to profit from? Nature takes a million years to produce our crude oil. Kior can produce it in seconds. The company took over this old paper mill where logs are picked up by a giant claw, dropped into a shredder, and pulverized into wood chips. Clean, Clean gasoline. Clean, green gasoline. There's there no, must be a downside. There is no downside. The bank that crashed the economy, ruined millions of lives, and has their tentacles on the levers of power, what would their favorite form of green energy be? One of the very interesting markets that we deal with is Brazil. It's unlike any other market in that today, alternative energy isn't really alternative energy. It's so much a part of the fabric of the society. The country began to, to utilize its vast resources of sugarcane to produce ethanol. There was a man from Goldman Sachs who was particularly in love with turning forests into profits. Has everybody got uh, enough coffee? You might want to get some more. Meet David Blood former CEO of Asset Management for Goldman Sachs. How much money did Mr. Blood believe should be invested in green energy? A, a natural alignment for something in the order of 40 to $50 trillion worth of capital. 40 to $50 trillion. And who was going to help the man from Goldman Sachs? Help him raise that astronomical amount of money? A gentleman some of you may recognize and know, Bill McKibben. It's entirely dependent on what kind of political will we can muster. And if we do not get this done very fast, then we're not going to get it done. And so Bill McKibben went forth to generate the political will for trillions of dollars in green investments. Our next guest has been called our nation's leading environmentalist. And you are, in some sense, the grand poobah of the environmental movement. My guest tonight is on a global crusade. On a global crusade for what? commit to divesting from fossil fuels. We can't justify investing our money in companies that are basically running Genesis backward. So when you divest from fossil fuels and invest in green funds, what are you investing in? I took a deep dive into Securities and Exchange Commission filings to find out. For instance, in the Green Century Funds, recommended by 350.org and Bill McKibben, I found less than 1% solar and wind, and 99% things like mining, oil and gas infrastructure companies, including a tar sands exploiter, McDonald's, one of the companies driving meat consumption across the planet, Archer Daniels Midland, one of the world's largest producers of biofuel, Coca-Cola, the largest creator of plastic pollution on Earth, 
logging and paper companies, including one that brags about biomass burning, and banks. Lots of banks, including BlackRock, the largest financer of deforestation on Earth. The business that they're engaged in is actually destroying our life support system. The Sierra Club also partners with a green fund called Aspiration. Aspiration also includes dozens of companies profiting from the destruction of the planet, including Chevron, ExxonMobil, Chesapeake Energy. In order to learn, the Russian gas giant Gazprom, and in perhaps the most bizarre twist of all, the Sierra Club's Green Fund's biggest holding is in Viva, the world's largest consumer of forests, to be incinerated in green energy biomass plants. Of course, one investment option is a green fund run by Bill McKibben's buddy, David Blood. And who was the chairman of this fund? Someone familiar. Use capitalism that gives incentives for people to do their best. Al Gore and David Blood partnered to form a company called Blood and Gore. No, scratch that. Generation Investment Management. And within this fund, Blood and Gore designated a special investment category, targeting $650 million of biomass and biofuels. Funny thing was, they partnered before Al Gore's film came out. Was that movie just about climate change or something else? On one side, we have gold bars. Mmm, mmm. Mmm, don't they look good? I'd just like to have some of those gold bars. Uh, on the other side of the scales, um, the entire planet. <laughs> if we do the right thing, then we're gonna create a lot of wealth. And when it came time for Al Gore to choose between the entire planet and getting him some of them gold bars, what choice did he make? Here is Al Gore earning his keep by pretending to care about the rainforest while lobbying Congress on behalf of the sugarcane ethanol industry. Any comment on the Brazilian effort here with the issue of the possibility of expanding into that Amazon River Basin with further deforestation to produce more ethanol out of sugarcane is a worry, and I, apparently you're not as concerned about that. Because no, no, I, I am. I simply forgot. <laughs> What's been going on there is uh, really very uh, uh, troubling. <laughs> And with your permission, I'll show you a very quick example of it uh, over a period of uh, 25 years. The invasion of sugarcane monocultures in the region clashes with the indigenous people's right to land. These are images of a last-ditch attempt by the Warani Kaiowa to resist eviction. Important to note that the exploitation of the sugarcane growing areas in Brazil does not have to inevitably have the knock-on consequence of, of uh, causing destruction uh, in, in the Amazon. Sugarcane fields are burning. They're set alight before the harvest to eliminate the leaves and tops of the plant, which makes cutting more efficient. Environmentalists blame the seemingly endless sugarcane fields for air and water pollution on an epic scale. And along with deforestation, the threat it poses to the environment is becoming clear. Once the indigenous families were expelled, the landowners set their homes on fire. Is there anything too terrible to qualify as green energy? Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Mabus and the US Navy for once again inviting me to speak with you today. The Navy's work to help launch this new fuels industry is invaluable. The US Navy has a special message this year. It is time to turn green. Joining the vessels is what the U.S. Navy calls its great green fleet of warships powered by fuel from renewable sources like algae, grass, and animal fat. Animal fat. 
time you fill up at your neighborhood gas station, you might find yourself pumping a little alligator into your tank. That's right, UL Lafayette researchers have developed alligator fat into a renewable source for biofuels. And once we run through the animals, what's next? GE, who brings you nuclear energy and wind turbines, is ready with a plan. I believe that liquid fuels, chemicals, are eventually going to have to be made through from sustainable raw materials. We believe that seaweed is one of the most attractive opportunities. Better hurry. One year after it was filmed, the seaweed forest was dead. You might ask yourself, how could men destroy what remains of nature to enrich themselves? Well, that's why they're billionaires and you're not. <laughs> the takeover of the environmental movement by capitalism is now complete. Environmentalists are no longer resisting those with the profit motive, but collaborating with them. The Nature Conservancy is now the Logging Conservancy. We will capture the most important pieces biologically, and there will be another large block sold to timber investment groups. The Union of Concerned Scientists has become the Union of Concerned Salesmen, having taken millions not for science, but to create markets for electric cars. The Sierra Club sells electric cars and solar panels right from their website. The best thing about Sungevity is that they make it easy for you. All that you have to do is to say yes. The New York Times partners with ExxonMobil to bring you the good news about biofuels. Algae-derived fuel could help us meet growing demand. Treehugger.com, which claims to be the largest single source of environmental news, was founded and funded by Georgia Pacific, a logging company. In fact, they are neighbors. Georgia Pacific is owned by our friends, the Koch brothers who are likely the largest recipient of green energy biomass subsidies in the United States. Yes, the merger of environmentalism and capitalism is now complete. But maybe it's always been complete. How is 350.org funded? Uh, well, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> who are your funders? Sure. Uh, to the degree that we have any money at all, it's come from a few foundations in which, Europe which ones? and the U.S. Uh, let's see, the, uh, I'm trying to think who the biggest uh, funders are. Uh, 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 there's a foundation in, uh, based in Sweden uh, called, I think it's called the Rasmussen Foundation, so, uh, that I think has been the biggest funder. So you don't get money from Pew or Rockefeller or any of those big No, we did, we, Rockefeller... Brothers Fund gave us some money right when we were starting out. That's been useful, too. But they no longer fund you? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have I don't have a sort of... <laughs> really? ...funder sitting in front of me. Uh, that's but that's usually we, something that people know. Rockefeller's been one of our... Uh, is, is one of... is a great ally in this fight. You just sold your TV network to Al, Al, Jazeera. Al Jazeera. Right. And that government is basically nothing but an oil producer gas mainly in oil. And so, if you got yourself an environmental movement and environmental leaders, why not buy the Holy Day itself? Happy Earth Day! Uh -oh. I need to thank Building Energy, which provided so much solar power to this that we powered the entire event with solar energy. But when I went backstage to see what was really going on... You ain't running out. this whole thing on that, Jack. I can tell you that. The toaster is, is, is 1,200 watts, so that run right there could run a toaster. And we'd also like to thank our incredible corporate sponsors who've been behind the movement to end extreme poverty and tackle climate change since the very beginning. We want to thank Toyota, Citibank,
We want to thank Caterpillar. We're standing at the construction site.